Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Greetings and thank you for inviting me to present here at this round table. It's a big honour for me and for the project team who I represent here. This paper is part of a wider piece of work called Measuring Accessible Journeys that we are undertaking in New Zealand. Our client is a disability advocacy organisation, CCS Disability Action, who are funded by New Zealand's Ministry for Social Development. So it's a transport project in a different portfolio, which is a different approach for New Zealand. This ministry has a program called the Think Differently Fund, which fits our work quite aptly, we think. And CCS, Disability Action, have a mantra, um, which is including all people, which I think ties in quite nicely with our conversation today. And our project in particular has a vision of a transport system that demonstrates inclusion. And that's the basis that we start from today. So my background, my name is Bridget Burdett. I am a Chartered Professional Engineer in Transport. I work mostly in policy and research around accessible transport and I'm a student of human factors psychology. So these two areas come together to mean that I really have a systems focus in the policy area of accessible transport. So within that, clearly economics is a really important part, but I'm interested in why it's important and how it can inform different questions so that we collect different and more meaningful data to make change in the world, to make people's lives easier. And I think sometimes we can lose sight of that ultimate end goal which is really important. What I'm going to talk through this afternoon is really a um, story about policy objectives and transport, how they work from legislation through to changing concrete in New Zealand. The economics of inclusion, which is our focus of our paper, why we think that this means we should ask different questions, use different data, and then really our main point is what are the implications, so what, why are we doing all of this if not to change the way that transport is planned for and investment decisions are made in New Zealand and elsewhere. So we start in our paper from the premise that transport should be inclusive. And there's not much hard economics in our paper, what we have really is just pilot data to demonstrate a different way of thinking than has been done before. But we explain why it's not just data for data's sake, because anybody could say we need more data. Well, what does that mean? We want to show that this data that in particular that we've collected is powerful in a lot of different ways. It works at an individual project appraisal level, but collecting that data we have found has started to change the way that professionals view their role. And so to, do, to make participation easier for all people, we need to prioritise tools because best practice changes faster than cities and towns can keep up. So to prioritise that investment, we need to make the lives of the transport professionals as easy as we can. Transportation is a really diverse profession. It has a whole lot of different policy objective areas. Some of them are really well defined and some of them are not. Some have a long history and sub-industries within the profession of how we deliver what we're doing, what data we use, and why it's meaningful. In road safety, for example, worldwide, there is a whole sub-industry around delivering safer roads and roadsides, safer journeys, safer drivers, and it really has this now safe system approach. This means that in the policy area of road safety, we have a separate vision in New Zealand. Ours is called Safer Journeys, our strategy. We have targets within that vision. And we have data so that we can measure those targets. And we also make the costs explicit in road safety. And the data that we use in safety is obviously crashes, reported crashes. We know a lot about where they happen, how severe they are, who they happen to, and what the circumstances are surrounding those failures of the transport system to deliver a safe environment. And we analyse road safety in increasingly sophisticated ways. So we started just with crash data, some in different places to others, and now we have increasingly advanced accident prediction models and tools to estimate risk in a proactive way. However, accessibility, which 
we define as the ability to participate. As a transport policy objective in New Zealand in any case, it exists in some legislation and policy documents, but it's vague and undefined. We don't have a separate industry for accessibility. We don't have a national strategy to make sure that transport enables more participation. We don't have any targets around what we even mean by enabling participation, who or where or why we might start. And we think that the underlying reason for that is that we don't have any data, transport specific data, around the attrib attributability of transport investment to participation. So the system we have in road safety of crashes supporting a whole industry um, and professionals doesn't exist in accessibility in New Zealand in any case. So when we say we want an inclusive transport system, we have no idea how far we are from that goal and we have only anecdotal stories about people who can and cannot participate in, in different times in their lives and for different reasons. So our research question then is, can we measure and value participation in a way that demonstrates inclusiveness? We want to move from a reactive rights-based advocacy for accessible transport because it makes accessibility a charitable add-on and not something that is inherently considered of value in the way that investment decisions are made. We want to have data so that we can develop increasingly sophisticated tools to get increasingly fine-grained about where we invest and why and what the benefits of that investment might be. And we want to be able to make transparent decisions about where to start. Without crash data, there's no road safety industry. We don't ask people their willingness to pay for a safe road. We just go straight to the failure of the system and build our models around that. So we think we need some kind of data about participation because ultimately in transport, we have an industry made up largely of engineers who are asset management professionals and data is how they work. And on the whole, transport policy makers and practitioners and managers in New Zealand come from this background of engineering. Most of them aren't econo economists. So we need tools that make sense and are easily applied. And then we need politically palatable reasons for the professionals to use those tools. So this means that we want an inclusive environment, but we also want an inclusive process. So we want people who are making these decisions to consider humanness in all its forms. And in doing that, we need to consider the humanness of those professionals and their habits and the way that they work and how that might influence whether or not they're likely to take on board a new tool or a framework that we set up. We need to consider how they operate, what they see and don't see, what their abilities and disabilities might be in their roles. So without visions and targets and data, the problem of transport contributing to less than inclusive participation is only going to get worse because we know that there are people, we have ageing populations, we're going to have an increasing number and proportion of people who have difficulty in their everyday life. In our paper, and in a lot of our work actually, we focus a lot on walking as the mode to demonstrate whether or not we can measure inclusion. The reason for that is that it's a part of most journeys. I think it's most directly attributable to participation because you can measure the last mile. You can measure whether somebody has made it throughout a whole journey by counting people at a destination. It's also an urban and a rural challenge. In New Zealand, at least, there appears to be a tension between the focus and the sophistication of tools to model transport, public transport congestion in big cities, whereas the rural areas and smaller local government practices are left struggling with issues of ageing and declining populations and seemingly no focus from government to help them to figure out where to invest next because the focus is away on the trains and the public transport and the motorways in the big cities. Walking is difficult to plan for. It's a really complex mode, even though it's quite simple at a human level. And this difficulty is reflected in the information that people have available about where they can walk, for example. 
So if we look up a, a road map anywhere in the world, we can be reasonably confident that any motor vehicle we use will be able to travel on the roads we see on that map. But there aren't yet very readily available sources of information to tell me whether I can get through Paris with my suitcase on foot. Or and, train. <laughs> yeah. So this whole system of complexity for walking is accepted. We just accept that we'll have to go out and try our luck. And we think that the lack of data might be at the source of that because the transport industry collects huge amounts of data about motor vehicles. And that is the tool that transport engineers use to make investment decisions about road capacity, investing in new links, predicting years into the future about what they're going to need. For walking, we assume that the footpath, the pavement, the sidewalk that is there is appropriate. Um, and therefore we miss out on this opportunity to plan for participation. So in road safety, the current culture around the world in the road safety industry is that humans are fallible and make mistakes. And when we first started collecting crash data, it was commonly said that 95% of crashes are caused by human error. Therefore, we'll have to train the drivers out of it. Whereas now, in New Zealand and a lot of other places, we have a philosophy that humans make mistakes and we need to look after them whether they have been drinking, whether they are tired, whether they are well trained or not very well trained, the system needs to account for that humanness and keep them safe because safety is the core objective. So in, ac in accessibility, we need to recognise that participation should allow for humanness as well. And because we don't measure at the moment, we lose the value of trips not made. And in fact, we actively discourage participation if there is a safety objective for limiting it, such as temporary works. We say, actually, it's not safe to go through here, so you can't participate today. And these interruptions can be ad hoc and unpredictable, and the value lost is not measured, so we don't account for that. I think the road safety equivalent of focus on a certain user would be risky drivers. So we now realise that this is systemic and all humans are fallible. The equivalent, I think, in accessibility would be to talk about people who have difficulties in their lives. We know in road safety some people are more fallible than others, so we have programmes for vulnerable road users, we have driver training schemes, we have older driver initiatives. We know in accessibility, some people have more difficulties in their lives than others. So if we start to measure and bring in frameworks for assessment, we can get increasingly fine-grained and sophisticated about who these different people might be. The ph philosophy in road safety is that the environment should keep all people safe. So our philosophy in accessibility should be that transport enables participation for all people. And if we don't measure where that's failing, then we have no way, as I say, of knowing how far we've got to go. Currently, as we know, there is not much in the way of economics of inclusion and in transport. We often rely on design standards and guidelines, and in fact, a lot of my peers in New Zealand have told me, oh, we've got a standard to cover that, as if the standard is coming down from heaven to save us all. And we don't value participation in dollars like we value human life. And this lack of measurement, I think, means there's no accountability. So as I've said, safety and efficiency and commercial constraints in particular can trump accessibility objectives when design decisions are made around a table of professionals who are all just sitting there trying to do their best job, but their pressures from other objectives are much more explicit than they are for accessibility because we don't measure the outcome. So the traditional approach, as I've said to transport engineering, in New Zealand in any case, if we want to build an, a new road crossing, for example, the first question is how much traffic is there? <laughs> what can we safely get away with? So it doesn't become how do we enable participation for this community, but what can we justify while keeping traffic moving and while not harming our road safety targets? We would like to turn that around and say actually for walking, and for transport more broadly, who is this community? 
These are different questions. Where do they participate? Who is not participating in this community? Would a different road crossing help them much? What is the value? Because transport exists to enable participation. It doesn't exist to not kill people. And yet that is the objective that often trumps access in a lot of decision-making in New Zealand in any case. So here's the crux of the matter for our paper, really. Ultimately, we will design for humans in an inclusive way. Until then, we need advocacy, and advocacy relies on people who identify with some kind of disadvantage. So I think it's still valuable to talk about disability identity at some level, but we need a measurable indicator of that, something observable, because that's how transport engineering and decision-making works. Much of our transport network doesn't work for everyone, but it's like we're scared to say so. Engineers are used to putting design loads and limits on other parts of civil infrastructure. We have weight limits on bridges, we have live congestion and delay reporting and detours. But we don't tell people who use wheels instead of legs, for example, you can't go here. We don't put up those signs, we don't publicly advertise it. It's like we're scared to admit that we don't have a universally accessible world, even though we all know that this is the case. So we think that one useful observable indicator of difficulty moving around, almost by definition, is a mobility aid. By mobility aid, we mean a walking stick or sticks, crutches, any kind of wheelchair, electric, assisted or manual, a walking frame, a powered mobility scooter, and a guide dog or white cane. So to confirm our suspicions that there might be some link between mobility aid use and difficulty in everyday life, so trying to identify who are these beneficiaries of universal design, obviously this proxy measure does not account for all types of difficulty in everyday life. Just like crashes don't give you the true picture of risk on the road because there are a whole lot of random influences on road safety. We have to start somewhere and it be helpful if that somewhere was observable because we count cars on roads so the engineering profession could readily adapt to a tool that is similarly observable on pavements and footpaths. We did a survey last year of New Zealand people intentionally biased towards older people and those who identify with having a disability because it wasn't a general survey of New Zealand public but set up to compare different groups. We wanted to compare older and younger people, those who use a mobility aid and those who don't and then align that with people who do or do not identify with having a disability. Now I've got a chart here which I'll explain. We asked people what kinds of difficulty they have in everyday life using the Washington Group short set questions which New Zealand Census now uses as well as asking people whether or not they identify with long term disability. So people in our survey were asked whether they have difficulty seeing, hearing, moving, using their hands, learning or communicating and socialising. And what we found was that across all of those groups, more than two-thirds of people reported also using a mobility aid. And in this survey, that was probably because 90% of people who, use, who reported any difficulty also reported walking, lifting or bending as a difficulty. And we know that disability is complex. We know that it is increasingly likely with age that people will report increasing numbers of disability, so it's not surprising. But what we think this means is that if you see some estimated catchment proportion of people who use mobility aids, it's likely that a lot of them will have other difficulties in their everyday life, and therefore they wouldn't be there out on the street if all of their needs were not being met. And in our survey, mobility aid use had a correlation across all of these difficulties in everyday life of around 042 
and we can't think of an observable indicator that would give you a higher number than that. So we also asked people about their participation in a wide range of activities. This chart reports a few of them, which are really social interaction activities, visiting family member in their home, meeting someone at a cafe, going to a park, a gymnasium, a church service, or the library. And we found that generally there's not much difference between these groups of people who do or do not use the mobility aid and their participation in social activities, which says that these people are not isolated in their homes necessarily voluntarily. They want to go out and do things, but perhaps they might prioritise that travel to particular times, particular places, particular methods of transport that suit them better. So it helps us to think that if we are counting people out and about, and there are 3% of people at a library who use a mobility aid, and only 1% at another library on the other side of town within the same population, is there an access reason why that difference exists? That's the crux of what we are doing, to look at who is not participating much more than who is, and to estimate what proportion you would expect to see if you had a fully accessible world. So we have done several case studies actually with this data. And the case studies aren't very scientific in terms of the samples and the numbers because it's a very small project and we didn't have much resource. But we really just wanted to find out whether this is something that you can practically do out on the street. And in New Zealand, we've mostly run these case studies with volunteers, often from the disability sector, which has much broader benefits in other ways that I won't go into. But we looked first at um, a suburban intersection in Hamilton, New Zealand. This was scheduled for upgrades to the road crossings in a variety of ways. So we did counts of people using it before the changes were made and after they were made. And because we knew where this place was, we could then look at the catchment demographic characteristics and therefore estimate the proportion of people in that community who you would expect to see out on the street um, using a mobility aid or not. This intersection changes resulted in some improvements to crossings. So before the changes, there was essentially one flush zebra crossing and the rest of the crossings, which is very common in New Zealand on roundabouts, is just a single refuge island in the splitter approaches to the intersection. And conveniently for us, there were a variety of different kinds of changes made. So some raised zebra crossings went in that were fully um, barrier-free from pavement to pavement. There was a signalised pedestrian crossing put in and one upgraded refuge island a bit further away from the intersection. And the reasons that these different crossings were chosen were purely based on the traffic volume. So higher volume roads had fewer treatments because we don't want people to cross there, it's dangerous. It did not really consider where people might like or need or add value if they were to cross in different places. Where's McDonald's? <laughs> it's on the bottom left. There's a variety of facilities here, I think Stuart. Um, there's, a, there's a petrol station, a, a strip shopping with stationery and um, what's a dairy in France? Convenience store. Um, yeah, variety of different shops and services, social services also. So um, generally for New Zealand, a fairly typical suburban shopping area. And we found that after improvements to the crossings, there was an overall increase in the numbers of people, which is meaningless because it was a different day of the year. There was an increase in the numbers of people using mobility aids, and there was a significant increase in the proportion of people choosing to cross at the formal crossing location, so not jaywalking. What we've then done with this data is to monetize a benefit for participation based on beneficiaries of universal design being people who use mobility aids. So what we have done is to say that for these people in particular, there is a saving in making a trip in a cheaper way than they otherwise would, so an increase in choice, and we assign that a $10 benefit 
that they will not have to spend on a taxi. They can walk now where they didn't before. And we assumed a $2, so 20% benefit for everybody else who does not use a mobility aid. And this aligns in some ways with what um, David was talking about earlier about different user groups. I think we can generally agree that there is a particular group of people for whom there is a particular advantage to having accessible infrastructure. And we think that some measure of that would be useful. We don't really mind if we count mobility aid users or not, but some visible indicator would be helpful. Obviously, there are much wider benefits than uh, dollars of a taxi saving. We know that there are benefits to the individual, have social interaction, health in terms of accessing health services, and also being healthier from walking more. Um, independence benefits, as we've talked about, there are decreasingly tangible benefits such as pride in, in being out and about, not having to use a taxi. Um, there may be access to employment for the individual locally. There are also retail and commercial benefits to that community. If a higher proportion of that community can access facilities in that place, that helps the local um, economy. And we think there's a benefit generally from having a more inclusive community. If people who use mobility aids are out and about in the same proportion as they exist, then they come to be more accepted as normal and monetising that's obviously quite difficult. But we know in New Zealand, for example, approximately 1% of people use a wheelchair. And if they were all in our largest rugby stadium, Eden Park, that means there'd be 500 wheelchairs there on game day. And we know that that's not the case, but we start to imagine the effect that might have on how people approach issues of access if they were everywhere. So there are wider industry benefits we have found to using this data, and we haven't used this data in formal transport appraisal. We've just gone out and collected it and talked about it with councils because we think it might be useful for them. But we think it can be developed to provide a return on investment. It redirects transport back to what it's actually there for, which is not... We don't want access just so people can access transport and move around the transport system and have a nice, pretty network. Transport exists to enable people to live their lives, and this provides a much more direct indicator of whether it's doing that job or not than counting cars or simply counting people being mobile. But we've also already found that this links provides a really nice catalyst for genuine cross-sector conversations, partly perhaps because it's involved a disability advocacy organisation and is funded by our Ministry for Social Development. But it means that we start talking with community development sections of local authorities at that level about why people may or may not be participating for reasons that aren't transport related. And it brings those people together with transport decision makers at a local level to say, well, what can we do about this? So it genuinely invites a more participatory process and we find that the councils that we've shared this data with over the last couple of years, even with this small amount, have started to change even the language that they use in other projects, talking about beneficiaries of design and people who use mobility aids um, as their market, as the, as the reason that they're, they're doing this investment and not just to keep them safe or to keep traffic moving. So the way that we use this data to estimate cost of trips not made is to use census information about age and gender specific rates of disability and then to estimate from that using national household disability survey data the proportion of people who use a mobility aid of certain age groups and genders. And we know that people who use a mobility aid are much more likely to be older, for example, so you're more likely to see more of, um, more of these people in where the community is older, particularly accessing local services. But you can broaden your catchment if you have a regionally significant participation area, such as a university or a large hospital, then obviously your catchment is much broader. And you can customise your estimates based on the kind of people you expect to see there. We did a count of people at the University of Waikato, and there was 0.1% of those people who used a mobility aid. So then we thought, well, this is a very young 
catchment population, what number should we expect to see? And it was about 0.5%. So the numbers are small, but the more data you get, the more useful that is. Crash numbers are tiny. The most risky roads in New Zealand have one fatal or serious crash per 10 million vehicle kilometres travelled. So it doesn't matter that the proportions are small. It's about having enough data and enough background to estimate how small or how large they ought to be. Let's go backwards. So not only can we predict how many people we ought to be able to see now, we can project. And we know demographers are very good at projecting ageing population structures and change. And these maps I've got here show an area of New Zealand south of Hamilton. Um, the scale there, the slide's probably 50 kilometres wide, I suppose. So these are what we call census area units, and we can estimate the proportion of people in different age brackets. The colours here show the proportion of people in these communities who are going to be aged over 65 in the next 20 years, which is some of us in the room. One women. No. Oh. So we can see that there is, as I've said, increasing tensions in New Zealand, well, increasing problems. They don't know what to do about it in these communities. They've got declining ratepayer base, generally older communities to support, a large asset um, to maintain in terms of their local road networks, but different demands of transport than they might have had before. And this is a bit different for New Zealand anyway. We don't often consider demographic change, except sometimes when we make walkability models or accessibility models, which to me are looking at the issue from the other end. We only use those models in road safety to complement crash data. We wouldn't just go away from crash data and road safety, even though we can provide prospective risk by analysing the environment. I think models of walkability and access can be more pretty than precise and more expensive than effective, because they're not easy to validate unless you're counting whether or not people are getting to where they need to go. And as I've said, this project has already had implications in terms of local government in New Zealand. Um, we think that the economics of this can be readily adapted. So it could be adopted as part of evidence to inform business cases and decision making at a lot of different levels from national large schemes, packages of investment through to local intersection considerations, for example. Should we put in a signalised pedestrian crossing here or should we have a refuge island? And what is the value? How many more people are likely to cross in a different situation? and where are they going to participate, and what value does that add? Obviously, the model could be strengthened, just like road safety, where it started off with crashes and get increasingly sophisticated over time with the way that they predict where and how those crashes are going to occur. But we've found that these indirect benefits of even providing some data are already massive in terms of accessibility being valued as a political objective in the councils where, where we have given them that information. The slide I've got here is based on a paper by Donella Meadows that's publicly available online called Places to Intervene in a System. And the least effective place to intervene is to provide new data to shift constants, parameters and numbers. It's very attractive because it's the easiest thing to do, to go and collect data and talk about it. What we've found though with our project is by providing new data, we're actually starting to shift the paradigm with which decisions are made on the whole because the industry exists on data and decision, evidence-based decision making. So it starts to change their conversations they have with their workmates and their understanding of their city as a place where people live, work and play and not just a road network that we want to be efficiently and safely run. So it starts professionals believing in participation as an objective because they can do something demonstrably effective about it. And this is the power, we think, of using different questions because otherwise... Politics trumps policy every time. And if we make participation demonstrably valuable, it starts to work on all levers of system change. And as I've said, it's resulted already in more interaction between transport and community development, as well as stronger links with disability um, advocacy and governance. 
And as we've heard earlier, mobility improvements have health benefits. We think that this data could be used to have national level conversations about where the benefits and costs sit in terms of ministerial portfolios. Why can't we account for transport investment with a benefit from the health sector, for example? Just like road safety, the more data we have, the more people start getting interested in it, and it can then create its own sub-industry for improvement. Ideally, we think with a cross-sector approach, like road safety in New Zealand involves health, um, police enforcement, hospitals, all working together on what they see as a systems problem. And we think it's the same for accessible transport. It's not solely a transport problem, but we don't have any tools to bring these people together just as yet. So what we think should be done about this is that we collect some kind of data, this revealed preference is really what we're saying. What are we actually seeing on the street to demonstrate the value of our investment? The reason that I think we need this is because transport is based on engineering, which relies on data and process a lot more than heart and soul and thinking about what might be nice to have. We can count visibly identifiable beneficiaries of these accessible environments and therefore improve our understanding of the benefits of participation. And I'd like to leave you with a phrase that we bandy about in New Zealand all the time when we're faced with a complex problem to remind ourselves of the perspective of why we are here. He aha te mea nui o te ao. He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. What is it all about? The people, the people, the people. Thank you.